the New Zealand Tech Podcast, brought to you by Gorilla Technology, proactive and strategic IT. Hey folks, greetings and welcome along to the New Zealand Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Spain. Today, we're joined by Glenn Morgan. Welcome along, Glenn. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Paul. It's uh, really great to be here. Yeah, well, look, it's it's a privilege to have you in the studio. We've, uh, you know, I guess connected over the last, you know, couple of years during this, uh, you know, COVID time. Um, but you've been, you know, UK, London, London based. Uh, so we haven't had a chance to have you in the studio. But uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're here in New Zealand. So uh, yeah, great opportunity to sort of sit enjoying down the weather. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pouring with rain outside. It's just feel feel like another London day, yeah, but well, a bit a bit warmer though, right? Yeah, Surely. it was minus five when I left. So uh, you could. Uh, I, it's much better. So even though it's raining, it's fine. It's fine. Yep. Yeah. I was trying to work out how to introduce you, but what I usually do with the New Zealand Tech Podcast is actually just to hand it over to the guest to to explain where they fit into this big wide world of of tech. So um, you know, how, how would yeah. you like to do uh, that? So well, pretty pretty simple background. Uh, I'm a Kiwi, uh, but I've been travelling. I went did the usual Kiwi experience of going travelling, uh, except for I forgot to come back. Um, and I've been out of the country for about 20, 20 odd, 30, well, probably more, about 30 years. And, uh, you know, I've traveled all around the world, worked around the world. Uh, my current, well, my previous role that I've just finished up with uh, was the CTO uh, at uh, International Airlines Group, which is most people would know it as British Airways, um, but as British Airways, Aer Lingus, Iberia, a number of carriers that are there. Uh, and I'm also the, what they call the director of Hangar 51, which was, the corporate CVC or corporate venture capital uh, group. And what we would do there is and do investments into the startup side of things. So one half was the sort of business side, working with the businesses and working with all the airlines and the loyalty. And the other half was looking at new tech and, and modern and investing in that technology. So all sorts of different things. Uh, I've been with IAG or British Airways for the last 25 years. I've just literally, well, I'll finish in a couple of days time uh, and yep. uh, and back here home to see the family and have Christmas and enjoy the weather, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's uh, it's a cool time of year for for folks to come home and I, I do enjoy it when we get an opportunity well, to... Allowed uh, to come home. You know, sit down. Yeah, well, that, well that was, that's that been part of it, hasn't it, over the last uh, last few years. So yeah, it's, it's it's nice that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have a... Uh, yeah, a level of normality that's that's uh, might be a new normal, but it's sort of, sort of you know closer to uh, to the the summers and Christmases oh, of, of years gone by now, which is 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 great. Um, and you know as well as that stuff, also um, you're involved in um, IATA, which some of our, our you know listeners who are involved in the the travel industry uh, may be aware of international air travel association, uh, there as chair of the digital transformation advisory council. So there's quite a lot of things behind the scenes behind those roles that you've done Yes, a, as well. And, and I guess that's good to sort of paint a little bit of a picture of the, you know, of the view you have and the sorts of projects yes. and so on you've been involved in over, you yeah, know, so over a period. as the chair of that council. And so uh, IATA is essentially, uh, 291, uh, global airlines, so it's pretty much 90% of the travel market space in terms of airlines uh, uh, belong to IATA, and that's the sort of travel. You probably see it in your little travel shop, little sign down in the bottom there, and that's not many right. people know yeah. what's behind yeah. it. And essentially what it does is it sets the standards and the strategies for the industry to to collaborate and work together on. And, of course, digital and digital transformation is is fundamental to all businesses now and of course uh, you know so we reported directly to the uh, um to the uh, essentially the board of governors uh so that was sort of uh, and under willie walsh who's the current director general um and we would sort of lead with what the strategy for the airlines needed to be how to deal with things uh that were happening in the industry everything from cyber data through to you know, transformation of passion experiences, cargo, you name it. Mm, great. Well, I'm keen today for us to sort of probably, you know, delve, delve into a, a mix of areas. Um, one aspect is what's the role for New Zealand? You know, what should we be playing when it comes to sort of aerospace and innovation, growing growing our economy? Uh, then the, the other side 
um, which is, is probably the you know the the, the bigger discussion. Although the, you know, we could probably go either way. We'll see how we go. Is is that uh, that journey of digital transformation of of you know technology and innovation sort of transforming the world of travel? And so there's sort of I guess some some past present uh, you know stories. And then looking towards the future as well. So I think there's there's plenty we can uh, we dive can into, del- delve into there, uh, Glenn. So maybe maybe we start on that side because within um, you know the roles that you've had, uh, chief technology officer and the other uh, you know things that you've you've done, um, you know over these sort of you know. I was going to say quarter of a century, but uh, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, thanks, it's, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's been said now, so yeah. well, there you go. Yeah. Um, there, there must be a, a really wide variety of things that you've, you know, that you've uh, been involved in and 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 seen. So maybe we can look back at what have what have been some of those uh, those things where technology has been an enabler for. Uh, transforming the industry. That's you know, this I guess there's so many things we take for granted now, but actually we're probably a real big challenge to get into into place. Right? Yeah, I, I break it into the three chunks and sort of you know that past, present, and future aspects. I mean, it, it, the travel sector is one of the most interesting sectors to work in from a technology point of view. In fact, as CTO, we were having a conversation just before, and we were talking about talent. What's one of the ch- challenges for most businesses now, and that's tech talent and uh, the great thing about working in the aviation sector is it's actually a talent attraction mm, because mm. we have a very complex business model. If you think about it, you know, if you look at something like British Airways, it's the second largest engineering business in the United Kingdom, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, it's big in its own right just in the engineering sector, let alone the logistics, the selling side of things, the distribution side of things through to, you know, the cargo, uh, loyalty, all of those areas, you know, so so it's it's really, you know, an attraction. What's happened in typically airlines uh, were leading in transformation. Uh, and if I go back many, many years ago, you know, you think about it, you know, supersonic travel, mm. uh, it was mm. a thing, you know, Concord, those sorts of things, um, right through. And, and, you know, if most people, you know, will realize now and it's a thing, you know, you, you can buy anything off the internet and go into the internet, you know, I can... Unfortunately, I'm going to show my age here again. You know, I can remember you know sitting at a you know as a, the CIO for British Airways talking to the board saying, you know, we need to embrace this internet because you know we need to you know uh, people are going to start buying tickets off on, online. And I remember directly you know that one of the senior directors going, no one's going to buy an airline ticket off the <laughs> computer, right? And <laughs> And so, but, you know, we wouldn't even think a second thought about it nowadays. It's sort of like the microwave. It's like the ATM, you know, you don't take a second thought. Um, where I was going with that was, you know, the transformation airlines and aviation have tend to be quite leading edge on transformation. And it's because they have a complex business model. Uh, they've needed to, to keep that continuous growth. Uh, and, you know, going back before the internet, airlines had e-commerce before the internet. You could walk into a travel shop, yep, yep. buy a round the world ticket, yes, buy several airlines. It was all in the back end. It was all, yeah, it was all through the computers, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah, but you ended up with those little paper tickets, right? Yeah, and you remember they, those paper tickets that used to pull it out. The airlines yeah. then digitized those into e-tickets, mm-hmm. and that was massive transformation. And now, you know, now it's on your smartphone or not even you know we're at, we're at the next generation where you don't even need a boarding pass and we'll probably come on to that in that future section but um so you know that that's the transformation you've gone from sort of you know having those e-commerce and then of course the internet come along and that changed the whole world and airlines and aviation had to adapt to that new world so you know there's always been some uh, interesting things uh, and, and you know the business keeps evolving there's huge areas autonomy you know automation there's uh, machine vision um you know using the cameras there's cameras and everything nowadays you know you, you you can't look without seeing a screen or a camera and you know so how do we utilize those ai you may have heard a lot more about artificial intelligence and what's happening in ai you put those things together and you can see you know massive transformations coming along um, but, you know, it started with those sorts of transformations, you know, moving from a paper process to a 
digital process. And, you know, we just have continued on down that journey. Because the airline and travel industries have been early adopters of technology, what sort of challenges has that brought? Because we often end up in organisations with, you know, this old, archaic sort of legacy, you know, technologies that, you know, we really wish would would go away, right? So there's that element of, you know, when technology is brought in earlier, if it's not able to be replaced, then it can kind of get uh, get get stuck in place. We, yes. I mean, what, what's, what's that look like for you within that sort of British Airways and, and uh, the IAG uh, yeah, well, group were dealing with some of the, some so of that. So British Airways is over a hundred years old, right? Yeah, so, yeah. and some of the tech felt like it was from a hundred years ago too. <laughs> so, you know, but I mean, you know, it has the latest, you know, cloud-based serverless infrastructure through to some, you know, fairly old technology. I, I think I would rephrase the question, which is saying, what is the business? It, we shouldn't be thinking about technology, right? Uh, technology should become invisible. We should be thinking about their sort of proposition or the business outcomes that we're looking for, the processes and the people aspects, and then the technology should be able to fit and be an enabler for that. So I think that, you know, over the years, uh, you know, technical debt does build up. Uh, that becomes like a housekeeping exercise. You need to ensure that you're refreshing and driving forward that uh, technology to keep it current. And there's things like, you know, cyber that you need to worry about that does it. The tech actually just, you know, goes out of support and out of service along those sides. And I think that the process is to just get, you know, quite structured about it, have plans in place, speak early to the business about things that are coming along. So, you know, don't dump something on them and say, you know, in the next six months, you're going to need to replace this system. Never would happen. You know, you, you talk to the business and say, in, in two years' time, we will need to invest X million into replacing these platforms uh, mm. and and engage it. So I'd rather say talk it about business outcomes versus its tech and technical debt and stuff like that. It switches people off. Tech guys are nerds. They, you know, they talk about lots of acronyms. And, oh, do we? Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we do. We do. We, we need to translate that between what's the business outcome you're driving okay. and then having just, you know, doing doing a tech's job should be, you know, things should be current, things should be in support, things should be secure, should be trusted and everything like that and let people be able to mature and do that but explain business outcomes to the business and that helps drive that uh you know drive out that technical debt so you should be constantly looking forward looking at those roadmaps and saying oh, i'm not going to replace this tomorrow because that's a difficult conversation right if i walked mm -hmm. in here and said you need to replace all your video equipment and all of this audio equipment because it's all out of date and you know trust me i'm from the tech department you're going to be walked out the door right <laughs> <laughs> um you know whereas if we have a conversation saying Look, in two years' time, you know, this equipment's going to be at an X age. You need to start thinking about how we replace it. There's some good reasons behind it. We'll be able to actually drive some better outcomes with the newer technology. Uh, and, and that's how you, you address it. But, yeah, technical debt's one big challenge. Cyber is clearly a, a, a linked challenge because old equipment tends to be the stuff that's got the problems from a cyber perspective. Um, but, yeah, you... You have a range and then on within aviation you have a big challenge which is you've got a very big supply chain everything from the airbuses and boeings and you know the dhls for logistics and all of those sorts of things so you have quite a long tail uh within your uh tech footprint that you're connected to so you know the iata uh so you know there's uh, billions of money, billions of money transiting around the IATA network, which is the settlement system that's called the BSP. It's the billing settlement system. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's where if you're buying a ticket from New Zealand and you happen to fly a British Airways or an American or, or another carrier, then Air New Zealand or its partners would pay, you know, Singapore or British Airways or American or whoever, they would pay it through this clearinghouse. So this that's infrastructure that's an extension to what you've already got. So right. there's your core technologies 
and then your sort of supply chain technologies you need to worry about and technical debt goes through all of that so mm, mm. and cyber goes through all of that clearly yeah yeah now looking at it from a, a budgetary perspective i'm i'm picking that you were dealing with a you know pretty big number in terms of um over overall budget but um and, and maybe you can let us in a little bit on that um but i'm i'm always sort of curious as to buckets that things get put into right and we often sort of you know it technology oh yeah that's a that's a cost center over in a in a particular area yeah. right whereas mm. you know i see technology as this this business enabler uh, uh, you know it should be thought of differently and we see that in some areas where certain digital things are oh well that sits under a marketing budget because that yeah. you know grows grows the business or you know and so on um how are you seeing that evolve and and you know and but, and what are the sort of numbers? I don't that think we're this is just a mediation thing. I no, think this, no, this, this, it's, this, it's, this, it's uh, across the board. Yeah, isn't it's it? across yeah. the board. And uh, there's two types of businesses, right? There's businesses that think they're not a tech business, and then there's businesses that think they're a tech business, doing services and product selling products and services. Every business is a tech business, right? Let's you you can't function. Most businesses today can't function without technology, right? So. I, I'm much in your latter, you know, uh, you know, answer that you were saying, which is, it should be about business outcomes. You should be trying to drive business outcomes. Technology is just an enabler, right? Um, and the role of the CTO was to be very clear with, you know, other divisions around the group and around the uh, around the business to ensure that that technology wasn't seen as a cost. It was actually seen as an enabler. Uh, and driving it in there. And now it's a constant battle. And most CIOs and or CTOs will have that battle, right? Yeah, Which is, yeah. you know, like, oh, it's just a cost. You know, the CFO comes along, it's just a cost. You know, um, or what's this number? How do we drive it down, right? Um, I think that what you've got to do is clearly link it to business outcomes. You know, clearly link it to what the CFO looks at as a metric yes, and drive it that way. And that was constant challenge that I had. In terms of the sort of broad numbers, um, you know, uh, we would have, you know, over a business cycle, a business plan, which was sort of three years, three to five years, three year cycle, would probably about a billion uh, pounds worth of investment uh, going into technology. Uh, and, you know, it's a couple of hundred million uh, to run every year in terms of running costs and other sort of costs that were uh, coming out of the technology. And of course, that's across multiple carriers. It's not yeah. just. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, uh, just British Airways is Iberia and Aer Lingus and Vueling, which is Vueling is uh, from people on the podcast is probably the second largest low cost carrier in Europe. Everyone may have heard of Ryanair or EasyJet. Vueling, uh, based out of Barcelona, uh, is the second largest and and carries quite a significant number of uh, you know uh, passengers. You know the group uh, that I work for, International Airlines Group. Um, you know we carried 120 million customers every year uh, so you know it's 530 odd aircraft in the group uh, so yeah there's uh, some things but you know answer the direct question it's about business outcomes whatever the executive teams are trying to drive as metrics should be what tech is enabling those metrics yeah and then yeah. you spin it that way and just like uh, I use a really good analogy uh, in the airline which is Airlines are very regulated, as everyone has known. There's there's certain parts on an aircraft that you can do X number of cycles and you have to replace it. So a fan blade can do X number of cycles. You have to replace it. You can look at the part and it's perfectly fine. All right? There'd be nothing wrong with that part. But because it's done that many cycles, the rules and regulations say you must replace that. Technology should be thought of the same thing. And most businesses don't, right? And what... CIOs and CTOs should do with talking to their CFOs and CEOs is talk about what is the life cycle of this tech right up front. We expect this tech will be okay for three years. You can run it for five years, but then you need to replace it. Uh, and then you need to just do a risk assessment. There's some critical tech to your business. Not everything's critical. So, you know, maybe apologies to the HR people and sort of some of that, but, you know, maybe you're HR stuff is not critical infrastructure, whereas running your websites or 
running your selling or servicing critical, then you should have a clear cycle time for that to yeah. replace. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of businesses don't have that. A lot of it doesn't matter whether it's aviation or 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 any business, which is okay. So how long should this be hit and play for? And what's my sort of window of replacement? Uh but what most CIOs go in is everything's broken. <laughs> right? They walk in and go, everything's broken, right? There's so much technical debt. I've got to replace everything. Of course, the CFO goes, oh my God, you know, and switches off instead of being really structured and saying, look, this stuff doesn't really care. We can keep it running. You might not be able to change it, right? And you've got to put some rules in place from a tech perspective and saying, I'm happy. We'll keep this running for the next five years if you want, but you're not going to change anything on it. Yeah. Right. And then you have your critical stuff and you say, right, it's, you know, it's reached its cycle time. We need to replace it. And just like uh, an aircraft, you would, if they didn't replace it, you'd lose your operator's certificate. You couldn't fly. And we need to have that conversation with the business, which is if you do not replace this, you're not going to be able to operate. Yeah. And that's a different conversation to have. And it's a much more grown up business conversation to have. Yeah. yeah. And it's putting it into, you need to have those analogies. They understand well, I've got to replace those fan blades, otherwise I can't take off the aircraft. Well, yeah, you've also got to replace those servers because if you don't replace those servers, you might not be able to take off either. Yeah, I find these these those discussions are are often easier to have in the sort of small to medium business where you're looking at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, we use the cloud a lot, so there's not so much of these, you know, elements that need replacing of, look, you can keep someone in a in a good, you know, the right sort of, technology on their desk and so on for you know one or two cups of coffee a day for that person and that's you know it's pretty easy to sort of break it down and look at it in light of that um so that's a that's an easy discussion but when you're talking about you know uh an airline that could could blow through a billion or could blow through you know more a lot more over a period of time uh then then those those uh those things are yeah, obviously gets, re really really important and you've got a plan you know, well ahead because it's not just a cup of coffee or two when you're talking about no. hundreds of thousands of of uh, of people and and technology that needs really really deep investment. Yeah, I mean, you know, at a peak period, you know, I I, I remember going on to a, a panel actually one, one time and we, we had this panel and uh, there was a bunch of very senior tech people around and you know and they were introducing one guy sort of you know you know, I'm responsible for $1 trillion going around the, the banks every day. And I'm like, well, that's pretty impressive. You know, that's, that's there. And I'm sitting there thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, how do I, how do I explain? And the, and it got to me and I just turned around and said, well, you know, uh, I've got about 10 minutes. If my systems are down for 10 minutes, we have to call the police. <laughs> right. And that's literally the, the situation The if, if you lose your operational systems at the terminal, you need to call the police in order to get crowd control to stop people coming in. You know, there's a flow of hundreds of thousands of people coming in, to, in an, into a terminal, to a busy international terminal. You know, you have to think about that. And so, you know, is a lot of, as I said before, a lot of tech people don't know how to translate business. And I think that tech has got a bad reputation, full stop. Doesn't matter whether it's aviation, or banking or, or insurance or wherever you go, telecommunication, you, they need to step back and tech need to talk about business outcomes, talk about what's really critical and, and have a you know grown up conversation. Could we run without this system? You know, and see people twitch a little bit and go, yeah. well, yeah, maybe. Well, then that might not be as important. And OK, you can therefore not necessarily you can run that longer. Yeah. Have a longer tail. Yeah. This is really critical. If I lose my website, we lose revenue, we lose customers, et cetera, et cetera. Then, well, okay, let's invest in it. Yeah, yeah. Now, another um, aspect, because you're not just looking at British Airways, mm. you've now, you know, now um, the IAG group has, mm. has you know, multiple uh, carriers. How has that sort of played out in terms of... Um, benefits and and downsides from you know being able to look at 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 the technology pieces because you know sometimes with scale you get you get some great benefits right but other times it potentially can can slow things down so you've got to you've got to have an approach to be able to keep 
the pace that that yeah. that's needed, right? So how how's that? How have you approached that? How well, have you taken advantage of you it? You know, you can get the McKinsey's and the Baines, and they'll come in and give you a, a, a very expensive uh, a portfolio of stuff to say this is how you should run it. I mean, and having the period, I've been through a set of cycles, and and mm-hmm. the, the cycles happen if is technology can be treated as cost. Well, naturally, you would consolidate the technology across, you know, we've got Aer Lingus, British Airways, Iberia, Level, Vueling, IAG Loyalty, uh, IAG Cargo, uh, IAG GBS, which is a sort of business services unit. And, you know, and you could quite easily go along and say, oh, well, there's a big, big number. We can we can save money and bring it together. Um, you know, as, as I was leaving the business, we'd moved into a situation where we were actually pushing the 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 decision making and responsibilities out to the edge and a really good reason being is it's faster the agile they're working with the business outcomes so driving business outcomes uh and then look at sort of taking the opportunities to consolidate on like joint buying so you know you could you could do it through a procurement and sort of you know you don't buy Microsoft Office or, or anything like that you can you can leverage your scale as a group and have office but let the uh, individual business units be autonomous in terms of their decision making and i think that's much better my view is technology needs to get closer to the business and become part of the business at the edge uh, very much like edge computing you move it out you know it was you know you got these big hyperscalers with you know aws and azure and everything w- what you're seeing in the vc world is this growth of the edge computing now, it doesn't mean that you get rid of that big hyperscaler in the middle. It means you collaborate in a much more network effect. So think of it in terms of big central things moving to a network effect, if that if that explains well. So smaller, independent, faster, agile, be able to make quicker decisions, have more autonomy about what's broken, what needs fixing, and doing that. So, uh, you know, I've seen it go one way or the other, and I think the distributed size are much more... Uh, business oriented uh, uh, example. So it, yep, it, yep. it's, you know, closer to the business and driving business outcomes. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of some of the more recent innovations and and so on, you know, when we when we were chatting over coffee this morning, it was certainly interesting, uh, you know, hearing some of those uh, things that, that you've been, uh, you know, been involved in. And of course, you know, COVID ha- has brought a lot of change uh, with it, and part of that is we're we're in a position in you know, many parts of the world where finding staff to do certain roles is is a big challenge. So there, you know, and the, I guess that you know at times when when I've sort of you know been uh, speaking from a futurist perspective, be it you know TV or public speaking and so on. You know, there's all these questions. Like, oh, what about the the jobs and so on? But actually, we seem to be in this position now where, actually, if we can bring sort of robotics and 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 automation to play, um, actually, the people aren't necessarily there. Uh, you know, wanting or able to do some, you know some of these roles. So there's there's I think it's becoming maybe a little bit more acceptable to uh, to to look at these things. And of course, people people want cheap airfares, and mm-hmm. airfares and, and yeah. costs are going up. So you know, how do the how does the uh, thing sort of uh, you know fit together at the moment in terms of the areas where where the innovation is is happening and the change is happening? Look, I mean, innovation's just constant, right? It's a constant, and you know, roles are being replaced for many many years. You know. Right, right back, you know, decades ago, roles were being replaced. And of course, what's happened is there's new roles. And I think even in New Zealand and the UK, certainly, there's more jobs than there are people to find. You know, one of the things that COVID happened is obviously, you know, get your operational costs down very, very fast because literally we went from 110 million customers to zero overnight. So that's a good way to burn some cash if you've got all of those costs. So obviously, all the airlines globally uh, got rid of people right it's it's mind-blowing that so many so many airlines still exist oh it's yeah, it's well, you know that the, that's a whole the, different story yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe should they exist versus <laughs> do they do exist i mean look let's face it airlines are what i would call critical infrastructure to a country yeah it's yeah. like energy security uh i don't you know you would expect uh, so iata published a stat which is public 
um, that about 70 percent of airlines global airlines had less than six months worth of cash runway right now if i was looking at a startup and still six months worth of cash runway i'd start to raise the sort of hairs on the back of my neck and going you know how do we get the, you know good one to two year runway at most 70 percent of global carriers and there's some big very big carriers had less than six months worth of cash um how many went bust during COVID? Very, very few. I mean, there was a couple, but the 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 reason being, I think, is they are attached to the the nation, you know. And IAG's done a fairly good job of. I mean, most people wouldn't know IAG what it stood for. I think it's an Australian insurance company or something like that. But it's International Airlines Group. What it did was worked on a. It kept the brand. So Aer Lingus is very mm. recognized in Ireland, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. We've, it hasn't become a British Airways where, you know, there might be sort of, you know, I'm I'm loyal to Aer Lingus, not British Airways, because I'm Irish and not British, uh, or Iberia, which is Spanish. Um, so IAG sort of done that con, uh, sort of much more of a sort of, you know, uh, a model of growth and leveraging it across the patch. Yeah. But airline scaled down massively and then of course it had to scale up and the roles we couldn't get people back in so there, there was a natural place to start to put some autonomy and automation into the business and saying you know uh, that's where it is and actually if you ask most people that are doing manual functional roles they don't want to do them right um, mm -hmm. and if you work with them they've got great ideas uh, and we've got pretty good use cases where working with the team not working with the leadership because you know that there are two levels, three levels extracted from what's happening on the ground on a daily basis. But working with the guys on the ground or the, the teams on the ground and and actually coming up with some design thinking process, you know, two day workshop and saying, could we do this better? You want to see the ideas that come out of these people and then using tech to be an enabler of those ideas, transformational. Um, you know, we, we took a three man pushback team. So, you know, you got an aircraft. Well, yep. So an aircraft uh, needs to be pushed off stand, right? And it's usually they have a tractor and there's usually three people, uh, one walking the wing, you know, two driving the tractor or one, you know, supporting the tractor and, and a driver of the tractor connecting the aircraft to this tractor. And it pushes or reverses the, the aircraft back out onto the taxiway so that they can start. Um, now we took that you know uh, sort of three-man team down to a one man to an autonomous robot it's called a motor talk um you could look it up on youtube or or anything like this and and the, what the motor talk does is essentially a, a little robot that the operator can walk on the wing so you've still got an operator he can walk on the wing and push an aircraft back autonomously and then he can disconnect and the the, the unit could go back and that's a significant good good for the company uh because it saved costs great for the operators because they loved actually operating these things so they could you know one of the challenges was you know wing walking oh who's going to drive because i wanted to drive you know who's going to do this <laughs> so now you've got these and in, these individuals are controlling these motor talks and doing those so there's plenty of roles they're just evolving into different skill sets mm, mm. so i don't and there can be quite a flow on from each of those things oh, right absolutely. you know you talk about it from that resourcing perspective there's you know how and i was on a, on a, one of the flights was on the last few months i think you know, you 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 have a uh, you know a delay that's caused by uh, you know the 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 people available, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, in fact, it's probably been more than one flight in the last few months that's been impacted by those resourcing type things. Oh, you know, folks are busy elsewhere, or someone's you know running around needs to do X Y Z. Um, so yeah, and airports and and aviation is a perfect place to put autonomy because it's a mm. structured place there's mm. real strict rules and regulations yeah um you know uh, you know put an autonomous car on the road and it's it's quite difficult technology to solve right whereas an airport it's much more like a milk run right there's certain things certain speeds certain processes must be followed legally yeah. you know and and so on that so actually doing automation airside as as we call it that boundary between the sort of where passengers see and then you know airside is the the below the wing where it operates is autonomy is great to have down there because it's it's a perfect place to have it and actually it's a safer you know so a lot of the time we talk about safety for doing autonomous because it's actually much safer it's consistent safer and those sorts of things uh and you know so 
th- there's loads of areas we could automate. I, I very much see the the uh, I'll, 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 I don't usually predict. I I I, I won't. Uh, I'm not. Great, you know, futurists should never predict because they're always going to be wrong. But what we can do is prepare for what the future could look like. And I believe the future will be what we would call dark below the wing. I there will be very few humans operating below the wing where today there's quite a lot of operating people below the wing and it will be more efficient. You know, um, I'm sure a number of people on this podcast have come in on an aircraft and sat there for 10 minutes waiting for someone to put a jet bridge onto the door so that you have to, your long haul flight, all you want to do is get up and get out of that thing. Right? It, yeah. um, and you know, that could be autonomous, you know, the, the, the guidance systems that you have to come onto the aircraft automatic the jet bridge automatic docks onto the aircraft. It's all very possible machine vision, AI, all of those technologies can make that happen. In fact, we've got um, in Heathrow, uh, a uh, th- there's a, an autonomous jet bridge that we're in operation trialing out just as we're going into COVID, we started to look at that and safety. And actually most humans actually like it. They're now sitting there with an iPad They've got three, four cameras controlling multiple stands and they're feeling much more valued as an individual because they've got a bigger role and better roles. Yeah, and uh, Qantas in the last few days, I think there's a bit of bad press over uh, luggage getting uh, getting kicked around by uh, by baggage handlers, so uh, autonomous uh, movement of yeah. uh, of of luggage i mean you know thing, things are going to happen and and the bots don't always get it perfect every time um either right yeah, so no, you know you got to you got to have a bit of grace in there yeah. for you don't know what exactly what's going on in in people's worlds but that that becomes another uh area that uh, you know over time will uh, you know will help make things more efficient yes. right yeah, I mean, if you walked into an Amazon warehouse, big distribution center in Amazon, and I'm sorry, I'm using a European sort of uh, example in terms of big warehouses, you know, what Amazon do, you know, they, they've got 10 minute delivery now, they have to have slick processes, right, uh, in London and stuff like this. So um, you won't see that many humans, it's autonomous, it's robots, you go into a car manufacturer, Porsche or VW group or a Tesla, whatever, you pick one, there's a lot more robots. Uh, airports, there's a lot more humans and manual things happening. Um, I think that transition will change. And, you know, uh, my colleagues over in Qantas, I feel their pain. You know, um, most airlines have experienced some sort of baggage challenge, um, uh, uh, you know, and it, it it's, it's a complex set of processes. It's a complex business. You know, if you take something like T5 um, at Heathrow, it's one of the well. It is one of the busiest international airports on its own right. Just terminal, that terminal, just, just that that terminal, terminal, terminal globally, yeah. right? Uh, you see this massive big terminal up front, and everyone that's what people recognise. The customers and people who've been to Heathrow would see that terminal. Um, what they don't realise is there's four more of those levels below that big mm-hmm. front house and that's all full of baggage and baggage systems and baggage storage and security and x-ray and all of these sorts of things so you know it's it's like four or five levels deep and i think it actually even goes a bit deeper than that because then you've got your trains and other bits and pieces coming in so it's yeah it's complex i feel conscious pain i i have been there i have seen some baggage failures ourselves but you know it's an area where they'll you'll definitely from a consumer point of view they'll see improvements coming and airlines sort of went through this very innovative phase decades ago and then they went into that sort of cost phase and things got worse and and i think most people would say that things got sort of worse and then what you're seeing now is with sort of some of the other newer carriers come along things have started to get better but you know uh, for example you know front of house you know good example of something in the you know what we'll see so um, is no boarding pass, no passport required, right? I mean, the paper documents. And if, you know, if you're traveling and you travel regularly, you got hand luggage, you know, bottle of water, and then hang on a minute, I've got to get, where's my passport? Where's my, where's my, you know, phone or, you know, this boarding pass? There's absolutely no need for that stuff. So in um, a few locations that we've done out in the US now, there's no passport required and there's no boarding pass required. You just walk up, the gate opens, you walk onto the aircraft 
And the amount of frequent travelers I've seen that walk through that and then turn around and go, oh my God, what, what happened? You know, they're looking like they're hanging, they're holding on to something in their hand and going, and you see them physically turn didn't, around and like, it. am I okay to carry on sort of thing? Yeah. Because yeah. the process is seamless. Uh, security. So we've seen these new, you know, you know, at the moment, take shoes off, take everything off, unload, pack, unload. Well, you know, if anyone's seen some of the movies, the future movies, you know, there's a, there's a famous Arnold Schwarzenegger movie in terms of, you know, where he just walks through a, 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 a set of cameras and stuff like this. And it, it detects that they're carrying something they shouldn't be carrying. And that technology is now there uh, and it's coming and you'll see it more and more. Um, there's a few airports now that you don't need to take your liquids out. You don't need to take your shoes off, you know, and you can just process. So it's all about that processing going through and making it touchless and COVID has been a great, you know, I've always said that, you know, uh, as a CDO, CDIO or, or, you know, chief uh, digital officer or chief technology officer, COVID has been the chief digital officer for most businesses, right? It's forced businesses to think digital transformation. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, COVID was, well, you, you know, who wants to hold a passport that might be infected sort of thing. So it had to go touchless. So, you know, the fact is that that document should recognize you as an individual, should walk through the, the the process and seamless. We had this, you know, concept of setting a business objective of not having to break your stride walking through the airport. So, you know, to just walk through the airport. We're not there yet, um, but we're getting very close. I mean, one of the big challenges we've got at the moment, bags. Obviously, Qantas is probably experiencing this. Uh, so a good another area of tech innovation that we're doing is been working with a startup where get rid of the bag tag. Mm, mm. You've got good machine vision, you've got AI, you've got uh, uh, sort of um, sort of quantum uh, aspects. So you can do what we call quantum entanglement, where you can actually create a digital tag onto a physical thing, okay. and then use cameras, and then yeah, just yeah. your local iPhone or Android device. Can identify a bag and say yeah that's glenn's bag yeah so yeah. i can see in the future even the bag tag disappearing that would mean that you just come along to a conveyor belt drop a bag onto the conveyor belt don't need to put a bag tag onto it anything like that so so uh, you know those seamless frictionless touch points will be what you'll see at the top and below you'll see much more autonomous and you'll probably start to see it coming into the aircraft in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, you know, probably know that military run a lot of drones already. You were seeing that. Yeah. yeah, it's not that far away before we start to see that maybe it's not two pilots in the aircraft. There's one pilot in the aircraft and a pilot on the ground. Sure. And uh, electric shocks for those of us who yep. uh, aren't, they sit down in the wrong seat. Yep. I, I did that in the last few months. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking or I wasn't paying attention and I was one row too far too far back or too far yeah. forward. And, uh, um, Tra you know. Travel's stressful, right? Yeah. I mean, travel's <laughs> stressful. And, and one of the things, we, we have done studies on this and that actually there's not many situations where you're not directly in control of what you have to do, right? And Travel is one of those situations where you're told what to do. Put your seatbelt on, sit there, do this, right? And 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 of course, what happens is then there's the stress comes into that and then people make mistakes. And so that's quite natural. But I think that, you know, nowadays, you know, most of the equipment's going to be on the seat. You're going to be much more thinking about it as being personalized and stuff like this. You're still going to get mistakes, right? And people are going to do things that they shouldn't do. But it, it will change, you know, I, you, there's you know, your seat will be much more telling, you know, trying to find the small numbers. I mean, most people don't think about the simple things like, you know, is the number too small for a lot of people to read, right? Are those yeah, seat numbers yeah. too small or on the boarding pass and they're like, you know, arms starting to stretch out or come a bit further out to try and see what read where they're sitting. Yeah. So these are the sorts of things you've got to think about from a business process perspective and how do you eliminate that? How do you make it really simple for people? Yeah, it's nice on the Air New Zealand, uh, you know, the international flight, so it's mm. not just Air New Zealand, but um, where your name's on the, you know, yep. your name, name's, name's up there, there, you know. Yeah. Um, and you know that if it's not so your name. You're like, and oh. that's exactly, <laughs> look, Air New Zealand, hats off. I mean, great company. Maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm a Kiwi, but, um, you know, I've, uh, they're great size to to – to innovate with and and have done a lot of great innovations um 
you know, I just encourage them to be a little bit more aggressive on that um, innovation trance. I think that Ian Zong could be a, a great, uh, you know, a, a great leader in the industry for doing some transformation. And, mm. and frankly, actually, New Zealand could be a great, you know, as, if COVID is the CDO in terms of that chief digital officer, then New Zealand's got their best opportunity globally. And that's, you know, I've been all around the world. I've in the valley, in China, in you know uh, Israel, you know where all the tech spots are. New Zealand could be one of those. It could be competing at that level, um, genuinely, you know, uh, and really driving things. New Zealanders, by nature, are more innovative. Uh, you know, it's the number eight wire and hammer job, and they make things happen and do things. So I see the opportunity, and in New Zealand's a great brand that's shown that. I think. Uh, you know, uh, even some of the work that Qantas and uh, Singapore and other carriers have done, all, you know, they've shown sort of some great entrepreneurial sort of side of things. New Zealand as a country could be that entrepreneurial thing. And I'd love to see New Zealand be like that. You know, yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's the right size. It's easy to test things. You know, um, maybe the government needs a little push in terms of, you know, well, Christopher Luxon, you know, is, is in the opposition at the moment. And terms of you know he's coming from that aviation sector so he's seen real world examples but yeah. you know i'd love to see new zealand think more innovatively mm, you know mm, it's mm. it's ideal this um this last period of time we've um you yeah, know we've often seen some splits in in thinking around you know certain things and you you know you talked about um you yeah, know walking through a terminal and everything kind of just happening uh, there's always an aspect when we when we uh, talk about these things like facial recognition mm -hmm. and and biometrics, which is just like boy, that's amazing. And then the other perspective of how do we how do we balance that need, sort of yeah. privacy and cybersecurity type risks and so on, as to as to how you do that stuff. And you know, I guess what I what I wonder is, can you kind of cater to a mix of audiences by by giving people that option of, look, you can be absolutely all in, hundred percent on the technology, but if you're if you're off to, uh, you know, with a perspective of, you know, I don't want this level that you can still carry your, yeah. you know, your phone, your physical passport, or or whatever, or do you think we're we're gonna just yeah. have to go down? down one track and it's kind of like it's you know it's this way or or you walk to your destination what do you think yeah let's unpack that first right and unpack that a little bit because i think it's really important firstly uh i'll talk about the tech side of things so the tech side of things we're going we're we're hitting what i would call the third wave of the internet so the first wave was very much the sort of read only side of things you know we may have had a an email address or something along those lines the second wave was this social and e-commerce wave you know which was you know web 2 you know you could buy stuff off the internet you could interact you could put your content up onto there but it was sort of read write uh and sort of read only move first wave read write second wave we're coming on to the third wave which i would call and some people call it Web3, uh, you know, as a terminology. Uh, I've struggled. Uh, I've met many, many CIOs. I've met many business leaders. I've met many VCs and entrepreneurs and, and everything. And I've yet to have a consistent what is Web3. Um, I, I'll give my definition of it. This third wave, I think, is, is read, write, own. Uh, whereas today, platforms own your data regardless of whether you think that you're i'm not going to give my data to these stupid companies that might abuse the data which you know and there's many examples of that happening um you know if you're flying you're giving your data regardless of whether you like it or not you're not getting on the aircraft you you know if you're going to fly to the states times as you yeah, walk through I mean, an airport yeah and, i mean yeah, if you're flying yeah. to the states you know you're going to that that data goes to the states five times mm. yeah before yeah. you even get on fly right the fingerprint readers at and, the other and, end that have been and, there for years. yeah that that they're, they're taking your biometrics mm, so mm. so it's a little hard to i've taken the, the 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 concept of actually the third way is very good for the aviation industry and which is we can actually move instead of sending that data all around those uh, uh supply parties and send signals to say that this data is good so you don't need to know that glenn morgan 
you know, um, you know, is from New Zealand. Is the New Zealand government recognises him? Blah blah blah. This is his date of birth. This is where he was born. This is all that passport information is quite, you know, person, you know, and even I as a tech don't want necessarily all of that data to go around. But there's no reason that you can't have this uh, situation where, you know, it's that data is trusted and just saying, actually, I'm not going to send the data. I'll just send a signal to say the data is good, right? And then, of course, you need the other. So this third wave, there is opportunities without going into the acronyms or into all the tech side of yeah. things, which is the tech allows the data to stay with the individual. It doesn't go anywhere else. It's not going to be stored on someone else's. Now, I'll caveat that with governments will store data, right? That That's, you know, but everybody else in the value stream from airlines through to airports, through to the security people, through to all the other people that would potentially today have access to that data, they don't need to see that. So that data stays with the individual. And what you then end up with is a signal saying that data is okay. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, um, and so the example I said about the boarding with no passport or boarding pass, when you come into the US, your biometrics are taken. So I don't even have to register the biometrics. So what we would do is we do a look up to the US government. They want exit checks. They need to know that you've come into the country and you exit the country. So they're going to use it. So what we do is we just plug an API, um, which is a, is a technical term for having an interface one computer talk to another computer. So, so these interfaces, what we send it and say, you know, we're expecting Paul Spain on this aircraft. US government, I'm expecting Paul Spain to leave the US because he's not a US citizen. Um, he come here for a certain visit or, or whatever. Um, and that check. So we've eliminated multiple checks because they're going to do that check anyway. Um, we've built it in and then we're saying, well, okay, we know that's Paul Spain. He can get onto the aircraft. So the gates are now uh, got there. And all you're getting now, instead of having all of that passport information, all of that data, including your flight number, who you're traveling with, it might be, you know, people might be sensitive about who they're traveling with or not traveling with, uh, all of that sort of sensitive data now doesn't necessarily have to go to all of that value stream. It can stay with the individual. And a signal just says, I don't even need to know it's Paul Spain. I just need to know that it's good. Yeah and the yeah. gate will open mm. and so that's what we're doing so it, it, it's very technical uh, hopefully i've articulated in a way that can people can understand but essentially your data stays with you yeah, whereas the good. manual process today mm. and mm. the people that are saying oh i don't want to go anywhere near the tech is then you, you hand over your passport to somebody and they stick it all in then they check it they have it ability to get a camera nowadays and they can scan it very quickly and suck all the information from it um you know so I think actually the newer way is going to be more safe and secure for the individual yeah. from a privacy point of view. It's better process, it's slicker process for the individual, but you always have that manual capability, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's not going to go away, but you will see the frequent travelers just adopt it like that because who wouldn't want to just walk through an airport? Yeah. 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 And and uh, yeah, there, there obviously there's government aspects there which kind of you know fall fall outside mm. and and yeah, there's all sorts of discussions to be had on on that front as to as to how we sort of move move forward yeah. with governments who aren't always that good with with data. Oh, and, governments and how love we, FOMO you know, though, right? How we, how I'll, we I'll let these thoughts up. I'll, I'll let you into a little <laughs> secret, right? The fear of missing out is yeah. the governments. If you want a government to to do something. You know, and uh, I, I, I'll, hopefully it's not to too many people. Uh, right? <laughs> I, I'd let you, you know, we used to, working with the US, we would tell the UK government, look, oh, we're doing this with the US. And they'd go, well, what are you doing with the US? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, you know, we, need to, we need to be doing this, surely, don't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Then, so, uh, you know, you, you can use that fear of missing out. So governments, some governments are actually very innovative. Mm -hmm. And New Zealand's in that space. Um New Zealand's quite lead with Australia and, and Canada, I think, uh, in terms of leading on the digitization of the passport, mm -hmm. i.e. having a standard way of, um, so there's uh, another body, and uh, part of the United Nations, the ICAO standards, which is basically say, this is what a passport looks like and this is what the things you need on a passport. Um, you know, New Zealand, Australia leading some of the digitization of that so that mm -hmm. now you'll have a recognized, if you've seen your wallets that you have on your phones, 
that you know is not far away from having your passport in that wallet yeah and therefore that that data just stays with that phone it doesn't go around all of the rest of that value stream i think that's really actually where we need to be yeah much yeah. more secure you're not going to hackers love honey pots right so anyone that's storing massive amounts of data right is a, a, is an attack vector it's yeah. a it's a it's a honey pot for the hackers to go after you know if i can get 100 million customers passports that's what i'm going to go after so from a cto perspective i want one bit of data in hundreds or millions of places right and therefore it's not attractive you know hack yeah. glenn morgan whoop de doo you know <laughs> i'll share it with you it's, it's not that interesting right <laughs> um but you know so stop those honey pots i think that is that third wave of the internet this web three people might hear of it um is going to help and and web three is not just some of the acronyms that are thrown around i think there's this decentralization coming which is sort of tech is instead of big central platforms is moving to the edge so you'll have uh, computers at the edge doing the processing it's ai you've seen probably a lot in the press and you've talked about on your podcasts this uh, you know we're going through a a, a renaissance of mm -hmm. ai yeah. you know chat gpt released this week and everything like that and uh ai machine vision edge computing um you bring all of those together uh with this blockchain uh, i say that with a sort of you know people look and raise an eyebrow you know ftx is a company that just lost billions because of this technology but this decentralization technology gives the advantages to actually bring this web3 together make a safer more secure uh read write own and when i say own the content that's your content you own not an amazon or a google or a facebook or a meta or et cetera et cetera instead of moving all your data to the platforms they'll you know you you'll keep your data but it does bring some new business models that you could do because you might want to sell your data so you might say well actually i'm quite happy for x company y company to have that data fx is a and certain so, data that, so you, that you, yeah you, and you, you can you're, say you're, Here's, here's access to my data and you can say i want them to have access for a year or a month or a day or, or everything yeah. so we will see that technology come it should be invisible i mean we shouldn't be talking about tech we should be talking about the business process yeah. how does it enable me i expect that a air new zealand or a british airways or a american Qantas handle my data securely safely in a good way let them you know do that and and trust from mm. that side now to, and I know there's a lot more we can talk about, to, but to wrap up, I do think we it'll be good just to talk about the opportunity for New Zealand. Yep. You know, we we um, you know have have had many innovative uh, you know things come out of New Zealand. We want to drive that up. We want more of that to happen. Uh, you know, for for our uh, you know economy to be uh, taking advantage of the the innovation and the and the creativity. Uh, yeah, you know, we often hear the, the the talk around sort of weightless exports and you know exporting our IP that it shouldn't just be uh, you know uh, beef and lamb that uh, that uh, that we're that we're selling to the world and and dairy and so on. Um, what do you what do you see as the sort of exciting things that are happening here? I know you've been meeting with you know with a number of startups and 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 companies um, yeah. you know while you're here or, or, or will be. Um, what are the things that sort of, you know, spin your wheels and give you a bit of excitement about our potential going forward? I mean, obviously, I, you know, my experience is based out in Europe and, you know, I'm expat and, and that side of things. And I look over to New Zealand and I sort of sometimes I sort of want to bang my fist on the table and think <laughs> frustration about why we're not, why isn't New Zealand much more innovative than what it can do? It's perfectly positioned. It's now got the connectivity. It's got the smarts. There's a lot of very, very smart people in New Zealand. You know, you know, you take some of the best AI uh, that Google's bought, a company called DeepMind. One of the co-founders is a Kiwi. Went to Rotorua University. You know, uh, the, 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 there's lots of smarts. Uh, Rocket Labs. You've, you you name them. There's some innovative companies all around all around the place. Uh, I, I'm seeing a couple of sustainability green the green agenda is massive it's massive for every business it's not just airlines frankly but airlines have a significant challenge 
you know, a third of their cost is made up of this uh, sort of carbon, uh, you know, sort of fuel side of things. So, you know, uh, innovation around sustainability. New Zealand's perfectly positioned to be a sustainability leader, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, there's there's the likes of this company in New Zealand called Carbon Click. Um, uh, and, you know, they're doing some great things about genuinely offsetting your carbon emissions and sort of things like that. Um, there's other other uh, really innovative companies uh, based out in the US uh, using New Zealand as the test bed uh, around autonomous flight. Um, so Merlin Labs is another good example in, in yep, uh, yep. working from the US, but also based here in, in, in New Zealand. Um, you know, and there's you know, zero accounting, you know, go to a simple accounting, you know, so New Zealand has the opportunity to be at the forefront and New Zealand's larger in terms of size is certainly country size, but, but, you know, Israel's done this, right. And Israel's turned its GDP into that, that talent, you know, a lot of startups yes. spin out of yeah. Israel yeah. and yeah. then end up in Silicon Valley or you know, out of there. Uh, New Zealand has got that talent, has, has got the ecosystem, uh, just w what's missing. And I think there's a few things missing. And I'm sure that if you spoke to a few of the expats that are based out of San Francisco, it'll be money, you know, investment, uh, government support, right? Uh, is the government actually encouraging it? You know, sustainability is going to be probably trillion dollar industry, not billion dollars, trillions. And it shouldn't be a, even a debate in parliament, be it whichever party you support. It should be, we should be injecting into this space because we could be leaders in this space and it could be the new GDP of the country. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening in farming. How can you trans, transfer some of that innovation into banking, insurance, aviation? Uh, sure. Pick your yeah. sector. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, frustration, you know, a, a plea out to the politicians that may be listening, um, you know, is you've got the talent in the country. You've got the core infrastructure. The tech has now, it was a bit of a, we were having this conversation this morning. I was asking about the, you know, the, the, the connectivity to the globe and in terms of the talent and the compute that's available, that's all sort of pretty much fixed and, and there now. So, you know, we've got the ingredients. We need to build the cake. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So New Zealand could be, you know, and I'd love to see a lot more and, you know, of, you know, driving these startups, getting, you know, really encouraging people to build a startup. You know, uh, we've we've met some sort of, you know, neat sort of you know, people entering the industry and they're asking, oh, should I go to a corporate? Should I go to a startup? Go to a startup, create your own business, create, create the next zero, create the next, mm. you know, Google. There's no reason New Zealand couldn't be doing that. We're connected. The world's small now. It's, mm. it's inter interconnected. There's a lot of great things to happen. So, yeah, I, I have a big plug. I have passion to say that New Zealand should be leading. Mm. It's not at the moment, but it's got an opportunity to do. Yeah, and look, I, I certainly hope what we'll see is we'll see government move up and those wheels turn turn a lot faster because it's all very well having innovation and so on happening at pace. We've seen it in the aerospace sector mm actually here where things have moved very quickly but we we struggle or we hold we hold back those those you know a lot of these opportunities if the legislative support and the government uh, funding support and and those mechanisms don't uh, don't line up right and it's all it's all very well if you know if those things get fixed up Five years down the track, but that's that's too late because there's a, or you know there becomes a, a whole lot of you know yeah, missed, and, missed and, opportunities. And without without the knowledge and the background uh, of it, you know, I I'm, I bet a lot of the conversations about tech, not about GDP, uh, in terms of what's growth for the country. You know, I think you'd have a much much more you know engaging conversation with the prime minister or or. or or the opposition or whoever about talking about, you know, what does New Zealand's GDP look like in four years, five years time? And what are the enablers of that GDP and what should it be? Uh, I think that would be a much more engaging conversation mm -hmm. to have. And I think that that's the conversation that needs to have, not, hey, we could be the AI specialists of the world, right? That's not going to work. Um, however, we've got that talent. We know we've got that talent. Problem is we're exporting it, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and others are seeing that opportunity, why can't we, you know, we've got, you know, best beaches in the world. We've got the best, you know, working from home is a thing, you know, it didn't have to be now you can work anywhere. You know, uh, we talk about these digital nomads. It's a, it's a trend, a massive big trend. Uh, so you used to have leisure and business travelers. You have pleasure tra travelers now. Sorry for the acronym, but pleasure, a mix of business and leisure. So people are not yeah. just going there. Airbnb, bring them to, bring them to New Zealand. Yeah, right? Airbnb are making yeah. a meal out of it and saying, right, you know, go and live on the beach down in a Hopi, where I'm from, down in a Hopi, right on the beach. The surf point's just there. Do your work out of the with the high speed Wi Fi, jump on the surfboard and go for a surf. You, you know, jump yeah. on your motorbike and go up the mountains and, you know, blast around on the on the, on the mountains. Do what, what you know, whatever your passion is. Uh, New Zealand's got that in buckets. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. headspace, it's tech, it's all of that come together. And I think conversation with governments would be, how do we increase GDP? You know, how do we make New Zealand sustainable? Mm. How do we lead lead the globe with, you know, the big ticket items that make things different, the green agenda? I got, you know, I can't think of any country better to lead the green agenda. Excellent. Well, this that's been awesome. Uh, thank you for the privilege of, uh, you know, taking the time out to uh, to join us on the New Zealand Tech Excellent. Podcast. Thank you, Glenn Morgan, uh, and of course, thank you to our show partners for their support uh, of not only the New Zealand Tech Podcast but the broader uh, tech and innovation uh, ecosystems here in New Zealand. Uh, so, yeah, thank you to Vodafone, uh, Two Degrees, uh, Spark. HP and Gorilla Technology. All right. Thanks, folks. We'll catch you on the next episode. See ya. Cheers. The New Zealand Tech Podcast, brought to you by Gorilla Technology, proactive and strategic IT.